In the town of Tofield, an unsuspecting couple discovered the body of a brutally murdered man. His identity remained a mystery for several decades, but now we know his name, and luckily that brings us much closer to finding whoever killed him. Today I'm discussing a case that I have known about for several years, one that really shocked me when I first heard about it, and one that has recently been at least partially solved. Today I'm discussing the murder of Gordon Sanderson, who was formerly known as Septic Tank Sam or the Tofield John Doe. Tofield is a small town in Alberta, Canada, with a current population of around 2,000 people as of 2016. The town was originally the home of the Cree, but the town itself has been named after a pioneer doctor, J. H. Tofield. Just outside of Tofield was a farmhouse where this case begins. The owners of this property had left it unoccupied, but on April the 13th of 1977, they were searching for the pump of the property's septic tank where they discovered a body. I would also like to cut in here and add that the septic tank was a below ground septic tank and not an above ground septic tank, which would have been much easier to find. Below ground septic tanks are usually used in rural areas like Tofield, for example, uh, and they can be harder to find because there's usually some grass that has grown over it or other kinds of foliage, so they did have to search to find the septic tank on this property. The body that they found was wrapped in a yellow bed sheet and bound with a nylon rope. It was covered in quicklime and authorities believed that he had been in the septic tank for at least a year, possibly more. The unidentified man had suffered terribly before his death, so just as a warning, things are about to get a little bit graphic, so if you want to skip to the timestamp I have on the screen now to avoid the grisly details, please do. He had been tied down, beaten, and burned with both cigarettes and a blowtorch. He had been sexually mutilated, possibly with farming shears. He was mutilated so badly that the authorities were not able to tell if he was male or female for quite some time, so you can imagine the kind of damage it was. He had died after being shot twice with a 32 caliber semi or automatic gun, once in the chest and once in the head. As far as we know, the mutilation of the man most likely happened when he was alive, which is absolutely horrifying. The man was around 5 foot 3 inches tall, but possibly taller, and likely was around 150 to 180 pounds, and in his late 20s. The body had been dumped in his clothes, and he was wearing a white t-shirt, blue Levi button-down work shirt and jeans, and Clark's imitation wallaby shoes. The evidence of his torture was also visible on his clothes. There were burn marks all across his clothing and even on the sole of one of his socks. Interestingly, while the killer had dumped quicklime on the corpse with the intention of speeding up the composition, it actually had the opposite effect. If the body had been placed in the water without the quicklime, it would have actually decomposed quicker due to the water, but the quicklime combined with the water actually kind of helped preserve the body in some parts. The man, after the discovery of his body, was dubbed Septic Tank Sam and also the Tofield John Doe. Authorities attempted to identify him through his teeth, which were well taken care of and had lots of dental work on them but that led, unfortunately, nowhere. They also discovered through his teeth that he had gone through a serious illness when he was around five, and they discovered that because that particular illness had affected both his teeth and also his bones. Two years after the discovery of the body, in 1979, Dr. Clyde Snow of Oklahoma was invited by the investigators to help with possible identification. The man who they had assumed was probably indigenous or Caucasian, was confirmed to be most likely indigenous. Dr. Snow also believed that the man was older than late 20s, more likely in his 30s, possibly even closer to 40 years old. 
He created a reconstruction of the man's face, but unfortunately it didn't bring forth any new leads and the case went cold. There were all kinds of theories that began popping up. Some people believed the man was transient or a migrant worker, and that was why he was impossible to identify. Others believed that he was a pedophile that was hated by the community, uh, which would explain the genital mutilation and how no one seemed to know him. Perhaps they were all covering it up because they viewed it as a kind of justice that he was murdered. Others believed that it was possibly a hate crime, either in relation to the victim's sexuality or his indigenous heritage. But there's one thing that most people agree on. Whoever committed this crime was most likely local, or at least knew the area fairly well. The farm outside Toefield where the man was found had a below ground septic tank, which was opened by a hatch in the ground. So it wasn't visible to any random person driving by. So whoever it was that murdered this man either came across the hatch opening by a complete chance or already knew that it was there. And I think that most would agree that a septic tank by an abandoned house is a pretty good place to hide a body. After 1979, there wasn't much movement in the case. This seemed like one of those head scratchers that would remain unsolved for the rest of time. But thankfully, that was not the case here. Investigators teamed up with Othram, who developed a genealogical profile of the victim and created investigative leaves to search for immediate family members. It was through this that the victim was finally identified as Gordon Edwin Sanderson, who was around 25 years old at the time of his murder. And this was officially announced to the public on June the 31st of 2021. So who was Gordon Sanderson? It was pretty hard to find details about him online, but this is what I was able to find. Gordon, or Gordy as his friends called him, had been living in Edmonton at the time of his murder. He was born in Manitoba on October the 22nd of 1950, but he was separated from his family at the age of nine during the 60s scoop, which was a widespread removal of indigenous children from their parents where they would then be placed into the foster care system. As he grew into adulthood, he struggled with addiction and had some run-ins with the authorities. And before I even go any further, I would just like to point out that unfortunately when it comes to cases that involve people struggling with addiction, people can be very unsympathetic and uncaring. And I would like to just say right now that if there are people who think that because Gordon struggled with addiction, that means that his death was somehow deserved. I mean, I don't think there's a polite way to say that you're a terrible person. So, you're a terrible person. Around the possible time of his death, Gordon had made plans to visit his biological brother, Arthur. But, unfortunately, he never made it to the meeting. Some people have speculated that this was because he had died, but unfortunately that can't be verified. It could just be that something else popped up in his life that he needed to take care of and wasn't able to contact his brother. Unfortunately, until we're able to narrow down his time of death, we're not really going to know. His biological sister, not having heard from him, reported Gordon missing in the early 80s. I wasn't able to find a specific date, but I know that it was somewhere in the early 80s. Um, and again, there's not a lot of information about Gordon himself, so I wasn't able to find if there was any kind of investigation into his disappearance. I'm assuming since I couldn't find any that there wasn't one. It could be that the police basically just told her that since he's an adult, he's allowed to go missing and we don't have to investigate it as is the case with a lot of missing adults. Like I said, I'm not able to find any information, so I can't present it. I'm just speculating. With the identity of Gordon now being released, a lot of people have kind of settled on the idea that his death was most likely a hate crime, 
with the history of treatment of indigenous people in North America, I'm going to say that it would not be surprising. It could be something completely unrelated. It could be something personal. Somebody had something against Gordon that they decided to deal with in the most violent and horrific way possible. Unfortunately, until we track down the killer or potentially killers, we will never truly know why Gordon was killed. And while I have to say it's incredibly frustrating that we don't know who killed Gordon or why they killed him, his identification alone will only lead investigators into the right direction of who killed him and why. This case is a an incredibly, incredibly tragic one that resolves around brutality and a family left questioning for decades what happened to their brother. I just hope that this gives Gordon's family a sense of closure and the police will finally be able to track down whoever killed Gordon and that justice can finally be served after so many years. If you have any information about the murder of Gordon Edwin Sanderson, please contact the Tofield RMCP at 780-622-3353. Please leave any thoughts you have about this case below um, and always be respectful in the comments. Like I mentioned before, I know that people can be incredibly cruel when it comes to talking about somebody who was dealing with addiction, so just remember to be respectful and that this is a person that we're talking about who was murdered in the most brutal and cruel way possible, so please keep that in mind as you're commenting any theories or speculations to just be respectful. If you have any case recommendations for me, again, leave them in the comments. Um, I don't know. I'm just posting YouTube videos when I can because my schedule is pretty busy now that I'm in college. But yeah, I'll try to get to any recommended cases um, and I'll hopefully see you guys in the next video. Bye.